Amen. All right, keep your place there in Acts chapter 2. Of course, Acts chapter 2 is a very famous uh, passage in the Bible, uh, the day of Pentecost. So I probably don't have to keep the secret too much longer, but tonight we're going to talk about Pentecostals for our, our last um, our last episode of American Heresy. We're going to talk about Pentecostals. Now, these are people um, that you will run into out there, which is why I decided that it, it needs to be addressed. So we're going to talk about um, the Pentecostal church today. It's become very big. Um, it's, it's sort of a mega church movement in a way. Um, part of the Pentecostal church has turned into a mega church movement. Acts chapter 2 is what their entire um, doctrine is based on. So I want to explain Acts chapter 2. I want to explain the Pentecostal movement to you tonight in light of the Bible. It's very easy to explain. It's very simple. Um, it's very um, silly, kind of where it came from. And I'm just going to explain it to you in, in very simple terms tonight. But first, you know, a little bit of history. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on history because um, we have a lot to talk about um, with the Pentecostal church. But the history of Pentecostalism be, really began in the late 1800s, the early 1900s. It came out of the, what was called the Holiness Movement. Okay? The Holiness Movement um, was kind of this uh, you know, real emotional movement in, uh, that came out of the Methodist Church. Okay, so basically, Pentecostalism came out of the holiest movement. The holiness movement came out of the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church came out of the Church of England. And the Church of England came out of the great whore, um, the Catholic Church. Okay, so basically, um, this all started from the Reformation. Okay, so it's, I'm not going to get into all the details of the splits of the Reformation, but basically, you know, you just have all these, all these bastard children that came out of um, the Catholic Church. And, you know, I say bastard children because they're fatherless children. Um, they have no father. They're, they're not uh, based on their, their, our father in heaven. They're based on their mother, the Catholic Church, is what they came out of. Okay? So, I have a, a chart in the back for your reference if you want to take that home with you tonight. It's a very nice graphic that will just show you when the Catholic Church started, um, where the Catholic Church split off into the Orthodox religion, and then all the things that came out of the Reformation, whether it be the Presbyterians and, and you know, Martin Luther and, and John Calvin and all those things. It's a very nice graphic that will explain all these things to you. I don't want to get into that and get off topic too much. But basically, Pentecostalism is one of those branches of that tree. Okay, So since Pentecostalism began primarily among American, American holiness people, you know, it'd be difficult to understand the movement without a little bit of knowledge on what the holiness movement was, all right? So many of the holiest, holiness movement preachers that came out of this Methodist church um, were actually Freemasons. They were, they were very heavy in Freemasonry, and to not get too off topic on Freemasonry, but Freemasonry is this basically, um, they have their own religion, and it's really a satanic religion. It, it's uh, ecumenical. They, they believe in a being, a god of some kind. There's no specific right or wrong. It's this very, um, it's a breeding ground for all sorts of doctrinal and spiritual aberrations. Okay, so any Christian should know that Freemasonry and all these different types of things like that um, should have no part of your life. Okay, so that's, that's the first sign that there's a problem with this holiness movement is where some of these men came, came from. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, I'll just read it for you. The Bible says, And no, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So out of this, free, out of this uh, holiness movement um, came Pentecostalism. All right, and it was, it was born out of a couple of, of ladies. Um, the first lady is Phoebe Palmer who taught that you could reach, you know, perfect sanctification in your life. You know, this is the name it and claim it type people. Um, she believed that, you know, this led to the Benny Hinn type teachings and all this. But it's basically frauds driven by people's emotions is what the holiness movement was about. Phoebe Palmer came out of that and she began um, what was known as Pentecostalism. So. On Pentecostalism, it's largely believed that the Azusa Street Revival in 1906 marked the birth of modern Pentecostalism. At the revival, evangelist William J. Seymour preached about baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about, okay, and the gift of speaking in tongues, which we're also going to talk about. However, others have said that speaking in tongues may have started as early as 1896 and 1901. Of course, the Pentecostals will say that they were, um, you know, speaking in tongues was um, 
back in, in Christ's day, okay? And, and it followed all the way through history. And I'm gonna show you examples of that through the Pentecost, from the Pentecostal um, church themselves, okay? In 1901, Bible school, Bible school student Agnes Osmond spoke in tongues in Kansas. An evangelist, Charles Parham, called it Bible evidence for baptism in the Holy Spirit. The tongue-speaking holiness movement began, so thus began in the early 1900s. Agnes Osmond, who is she? On 11 p.m. January 1st, 1901, Agnes Osmond, who began attending Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas, requested that hands, most likely those of Charles Parham, be laid on her so she would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. While typically praying the benediction of Hebrews 13, 20 through 21, um, she claims um, that it was common for me to repeat these verses while praying, and if hands were laid upon my head, that the Holy Spirit would fall upon me, and I began to speak in tongues, glorifying God. I talked, this is her quote, I talked several languages, and it was clearly manifest when a new dialect was spoken, meaning a, a language no one had ever heard before. I had the added joy and glory in my heart longed for, and a depth of the presence of the Lord within that I had never known before. It was as if rivers of living water were proceeding from my inner no, innermost being. By 1909, at the Los Angeles Azusa Street Mission under pastoral, the pastorate of William J. Seymour, with the aid of Lucy Farrow, an estimated 50,000 people had received this experience of speaking in tongues. Later in life, Agnes actually rejected that all people would speak in tongues, saying, some time ago I tried but failed to have an article printed which wrote, calling attention to what I am sure God showed me was an error, or was in error. So basically things got out of hand, tens of thousands of people started doing this, and you know, that's where modern United States Pentecostalism came from, okay? Now, the Pentecostal Church International will claim that tongue speaking is from, you know, antiquity, okay? Um, they claim, and here's some examples, this is from their, from their website, from their colleges. Um, their first example is St. Augustine, who lived in the fourth century, also wrote, we still do what the apostles did, and they lay hands on the Samaritans and called down the Holy Spirit on them by the laying of hands. It is, expect, is expected that converts should speak with new tongues. So St. Augustine, Catholic, okay? St. Hildegard, who lived in the 12th century. She was a German abbess who was raised a Catholic cloister, but was not educated because she was sickly. Nevertheless, it was recorded that she was able to interpret Latin scriptures and speak and interpret an entirely unknown language. So she was another tongue speaker that the modern Pentecostal International Church will, another Catholic, by the way. The Reformation, Dr. Martin Luther was a prophet, evangelist, and speaker in tongues. This is another one that they claim. 19th century, the Quakers were followed in the 18th century by a group that surpassed them in religious emotionalism. These were called the Shaking Quakers, or the Shakers. The that's, that's where they got the name from, the Shaking Quakers, later known as just the Shakers, because they would just be, they would get worked up into frenzies in their, in their services and this emotionalism that was turned into the holiness movement, and they would just be like, ah, 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 ah. Shakers. I'm, it's not funny. This is serious stuff here. This happened. This, this is where Pentecostals came from. All right? So, the Shakers, they were very Pentecostal in nature. Some of it attended, confessed their sins aloud, crying for mercy. Some went into trances, and they were just convinced of Christ's imminent second coming. You know, once again, you know, this is people that are just waiting for the world to end are perfect people to just get into your cult. You know, we've learned that. If there's not, if one thing that we've learned, it's that, right? People that want the world to end and Christ to just return right now, Jesus, come get me right now, those are the people that will get pulled into cults, all right? Coming to America. Still Pentecostal, this is still the Pentecostal's church examples of tongue speaking throughout history. So what I'm reading you here is how they say that, so if a Baptist gets up and preaches and says, Pentecostalism was invented in 1906 by this crazy lady, they'll say, no, people were speaking in tongues since St. Augustine, since the Apostles. So they used St. Augustine, some other Catholics, Dr. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, right? I mean, Martin Luther, I'm sorry. It's, it's Martin Luther King Day on Monday. I'm all messed up. Martin Lucifer King. All right. So basically, they're using all these people who aren't even saved as examples. 
Okay? It gets even better, still, from their, from their website. Coming to America, we find another religious sect called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as the Mormon Church, founded by Joseph Smith in 1830. The seventh article of faith of the Latter-day Saints states that they believe in the gift of tongues. Now, we've had many men who have had the gift of tongues out in the world preach this gospel in a language but they had no knowledge. So unless the gift of tongues and the interpretation thereof are enjoyed by the saints in our day, then we are lacking one of the evidences of true faith. So basically, these are all the evidences they claim. Catholics, Lutherans, and Mormons. I mean, wow. So, you know, this, by the way, this is the importance of, you know, the trail of blood and the martyr's mirror, because this shows a, hist a Baptist history of actual doctrine. Okay, it shows a Baptist history of people that were killed for actual doctrine. And the doctrine is listed in history, you see? It's not just people just speaking in tongues, whatever that even means, from all these different faiths that weren't even saved. We have saved Baptists throughout history, all the way back to the apostles and, he, and he, to Jesus Christ, that hold the same doctrine that we do. And it's documented. This is, is, is poor documentation at, at best. Quakers, Mormons, Catholics, I mean, come on, right? So, the reason I bring up the Pentecostals and the reason that we need to talk about these people and what they believe is because today, Pentecostals, they might look like you. They might talk like you. Many look like Baptists. They may act like Baptists. But let's look at their doctrine in light of the Bible. Okay, the first thing I want to look at, turn to Matthew chapter 3. Let's get past the history and just look straight into the doctrine right now. The first thing I want to look at is this baptism of the Holy Spirit. This baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Look down at verse number 11. Matthew chapter 3 in verse number 11. And the Bible reads, Indeed, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. This is John the Baptist, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Let's look further into baptism of the Holy Ghost. So John says that, you know, Jesus is going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. That's what John the Baptist says, okay? Look at Acts chapter 1 in verse number 5. And we see just the same thing, more evidence of this same type of, of statement here. In Acts chapter 1 in verse number 5, the Bible says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. But then look what it says. Not many days hence. He's talking here about a specific act that is going to happen soon. In, in, in not many days, this is going to happen. Okay? Look at verse number 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. Verse number 8, pay attention here. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So I want to point out two things there. The Bible says the Holy Ghost will come upon you. So we see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and this the Holy Ghost coming upon you are, are being used together. Okay? And then look at verse number... And then you see right after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, we see for what reason. For what reason is the Holy Ghost coming upon them? And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Okay? So the Holy Ghost is going to come upon them for a very specific reason. So they can be witnesses unto him. Okay? Turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And I want to show you these two paired up ideas together again, okay? In Acts chapter 4, look at verse number 31. The Bible says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So you see, before it said the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now it says, filled with the Holy Ghost. And then it says, And they spake the word of God with boldness. So they were filled with the Holy Ghost. For what reason? 
For what reason were they filled with the Holy Ghost? To speak the word of God with boldness. Okay? There's a very specific reason. So we see the Bible uses these terms filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible uses this term baptized with the Holy Ghost. The Bible uses this term the Holy Ghost come upon you. All in the same manner. Okay? Now, turn back to Acts chapter 2. Let's look at the day of Pentecost. This is where it happens to them. The day of Pentecost. This is the story from Acts chapter 2. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in, you know, the baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost coming upon them, being filled with the Spirit, all the same thing. You see where I'm going with this? In Acts chapter 2, it was for a specific reason we saw in the verses before. In Acts chapter 2, it was a very specific reason as well. It was a very specific miracle that we just read about at the day of Pentecost. It was for a very specific reason, okay? Believers today, now look, so we see that we're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost coming upon them, and baptism of the Holy Spirit, those are, those are used interchangeably. That's the point I want to make about baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, believers today, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So we see that there's a filling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can come upon you, and, you know, this baptism of the Holy Spirit are used interchangeably in the Bible. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Where the Bible says this, in verse 13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So there's a sealing of the Holy Spirit when you believe. So when you believe, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So that's something different that happens to every believer. What happened on the day of Pentecost was something very special. It was a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. This is the story of Cornelius and Peter going to Cornelius. And in Acts chapter 11, in verse number 12, the Bible reads, And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. So here it happened again. It happened to the Gentiles. The Holy Ghost fell on them, right? As it happened to them at the beginning. And then in verse 16, the Bible says, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So you see the Holy Ghost falling on them is the same as being baptized by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Is that not clear right there? Very clear, right? They're used interchangeably. All right? I know I'm beating that one to death, but this is what we have to do. Verse 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? So, God gave them this gift, but what did you have to do? What was the precursor to getting the gift? Believing, Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Being saved. So did Mormons ever have this gift? Catholics ever have this gift? Lutherans ever, Martin Luther ever have this gift? No. These people are not saved. They've never had this gift. So whatever gift that they had, whatever that was, is something different. That's right. And we're going to see what that is. Okay? When they heard these things, verse 18, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So these people got saved, and they also got the Holy Spirit. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fell on them. Same thing. Okay? The day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 that we just read about was a miracle of the Holy Ghost. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It was a miracle of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon them for a specific reason of preaching the gospel to people that were there. Okay? So the two points I want to get across right now on baptism of the Holy Ghost. So as far as the Holy Ghost and you are concerned, the Bible says, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you there? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse number 22. And the Bible says, Who hath also, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit 
in our hearts. So if you're saved, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. You're sealed, and God is giving you that earnest. It's a down payment on you. Okay? But the Bible also teaches that you can be filled with the Holy Ghost. You can be full of the Holy Ghost. Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost before he was killed in the book of Acts. Barnabas was full of the Spirit and of faith. Remember how we tied faith and the filling of the Spirit together? As your faith increases, so will your filling of the Spirit. So all these things go together. So you're sealed if you're saved. Okay? You have that earnest of your salvation. You know, that's proof, that's just another proof of eternal security that God's not going to leave the Holy Spirit behind. You know, that's, that's your down payment. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit. But you can also be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? So, it's all the same thing in the Bible. And it always had the same purpose. And they spake the word of God with boldness. That's what it says after they were filled or they were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, he said. I mean, it was, a, it was the purpose. It was the purpose of it. I mean, you think, that, well, the Holy Ghost is just going to waste his time to do nothing? There's a purpose of it. The Holy Ghost filled them so they could, they could proclaim God's word with boldness. I pray for this all the time. I pray that God would fill me with the Spirit. Because, I mean, I can't do this by myself. I mean, this is a big responsibility, preaching the Word of God here. I mean, I pray for this all the time. I'm just like, please, just fill me with your Spirit, Lord. I mean, it's, it's, it's something I need. Okay? So, baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know I'm beating this. I'm kicking this horse, like, to death. There's an entire religion based on this, though. Okay? Baptism of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming upon you, same thing. Okay? With me so far? Now, let's take this thing way too far. Okay? Let's just blow it out of proportion and make a whole religion out of it. Let's talk about speaking in tongues. Turn back to Acts chapter 2. Look, I don't deny that it's happening. I've never personally been in one of these churches and, and seen it happen. I know many people who have. I know many people who came out of these churches, um, got saved, and that used to be in these types of churches. Um, I'll, I'll tell you know, so what is it though? It's happening. I mean, I, I acknowledge that. Everybody acknowledges that. You can get on YouTube and see that. So what is it? Is it of God? Turn to Acts chapter 2. Let's look at the day. Let's, let's dissect the day of Pentecost. All right? Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, what, what, what's going on? And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So there's all these people on, at this festival, at this time of, of religion, uh, the, 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 the festival of weeks or whatever you call it. And there are all these people from all over the world in Jerusalem. And they speak all kinds of different languages. Okay, that's just a fact. And in verse number 6 it says, When this no was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. You see that? So when they speak with other tongues, they're speaking in other what? Languages. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? One of the other reasons that Jesus used ordinary men in his ministry. Because what if these were like, you know, doctors of theology, big guys from college. Everyone could be like, okay, maybe they knew all these languages or whatever. No, these were just fishermen. They were fishermen and tax collectors and working men, just like us. And all of a sudden, they could just speak all these other languages. And they were amazed and marveled because of that. And now we hear every man in what? in our own tongue, in our own language wherein we were born. So our own tongue that we were born, it wasn't gibberish. They were speaking languages. And it was a miracle because these men, they just, they just spoke these languages. And they didn't know these languages. It was a miracle of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse number 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So there it is. They're speaking in, the t in our tongues, in the Arabian tongue. What are they speaking? The Word of God. It's just like we saw in Acts chapter 4 and the verses we read before. They were given this miracle to do a specific thing, to get some certain work done. 
And that was to proclaim the word of God, to proclaim the gospel to all these different people in these different nations. God used this Jerusalem with all these different people in it to use these men to baptize them with the Holy Spirit and fill them with the Holy Spirit to speak all these languages to get the gospel to the world. Amen. That's what he did. And there, I mean, you see that language and tongues are used interchangeably. The Bible defines it that way. And they're preaching the gospel. The miracle had a purpose, folks. The miracle had a purpose. I mean, as if the Holy Ghost would just come upon them and just, they'd just be like, Habalabalamakapa. I mean, doesn't make any sense, right? Verse 16 gets even better. But this is, which was, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Turn to Joel chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. So he's pouring out his Spirit on them, and they will prophesy. Remember that word, prophesy. All right? Joel chapter 2. Look at verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. This was a fulfillment of prophecy. What happened on the day of Pentecost not only had a function, but it was a fulfillment of prophecy, which is what Jesus did over and over and over was just fulfill prophecy of the Old Testament. That's why it had to be him. There's nobody else that could fit that could fit all these dozens and dozens and dozens of prophecies. And this was just one more that was prophesying. He prophesied the temple being destroyed. I mean, all kinds of different things. This is just one more. This is another reason why women are, or why women go soul winning. Because the women were prophesying too. They were preaching the gospel. That's what they were doing. That's why women go soul winning and preach the gospel. Pentecost, the Pentecostal movement was one of the very first movements to ordain women as pastors. Because it was women that started out with all this emotional tongue speaking thing in the early 1900s. But were these women that were prophesying in Jerusalem, were they running churches? No, they were preaching the word of God to people. Okay? And it happened to people who were saved. All right? Mormons? I mean, are you serious? You gonna use that? Now look, here's where it gets really good, all right? Because you think that that's it, but no, the Bible digs even deeper into this. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. It was already happening to a degree in Paul's day. People were trying to mimic the apostles. They were trying to mimic what the apostles did on this great miracle day, all right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Preach. That's what it means. Preach the gospel. Verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So he's making a, 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 a clarification between prophesying and speaking in an unknown tongue. Okay? So keep that in mind. He's saying, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. If I speak Russian and none of you speak Russian, and I sit up here and I just speak Russian the whole time, the only person I'm talking to is God. You guys can't understand a thing I'm saying. That's what he's saying. Yeah. People were sitting there and they were talking in church. First of all, even these people weren't like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. they were speaking a language, but it was just a language that nobody else could understand. And he's saying, what are you doing? It's not edifying. If you're going to sit there and pray in front of the church in an unknown language, you're only edifying yourself. That's what he says. He continues. Where are we at? Verse 5. I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. So he's saying, speak with languages and other languages, but I would just rather you preached. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Is this hard to understand? I mean, if I get up here and I speak Russian to you, you don't understand what I'm talking about. 
if I had a if I had an interpreter, it would be better, right? I mean, it would still be annoying, but it would be better. At least you would understand what I'm saying. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? There's no profit. See that? I mean, he just he just says it again and again and again. Verse number eight. Let's skip down. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? You know, a trumpet like. Uh, like a bugle call, right? This is what he's saying. A bugle call, like a reveille, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, has a certain sound, so people know, oh, it's time to wake up, or a certain sound, oh, it's time to go to war, or a certain sound, it's oh, we go this way and they go that way. I mean, that's how they used to control battles. Maybe they still do, for all I know. I don't know. But my point is that he's saying if it's just a bunch of random notes, it, it means nothing. Number nine. So likewise, ye except ye utter by the tongue. Now he's talking about the literal tongue in your mouth in that verse, words easily to be understood, how shall it be known that what is spoken? For ye speak into the air. Therefore I know not the meaning, verse 11, meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Two guys standing there, I mean, if you're speaking Spanish and I'm speaking Russian, you're like a barbarian to me and I'm like a barbarian to you. That's what he's saying. Right? I mean, how many times does he have to say it in how many different ways? Right? So basically you have this, and then look at verse 18. He's like, I thank my God that I speak with more tongues, with tongues more than you all. He's like, I know more languages than any of you. I mean, Paul is an extremely educated man. Remember Festus who said, much learning has made you mad? Paul? 19. He's saying, I know... I know way more languages than any of you. Verse 19, yet in church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words and an unknown tongue. It's better that he would get up and say five words that you would understand than if he would speak 10,000 words that you wouldn't understand. I mean, is that easy to understand? It, I mean... Again and again and again. Look down to verse number 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. So the tongues, the tongues in Jerusalem, when they spoke with other languages, that was the sign for people who didn't believe. They're like, whoa, there's a big miracle happening here. And a lot of people got saved by that. But then he's saying, but prophesying, by me preaching to you, this is another reason that church is for people who are saved. Yeah. Prophesying, preaching is for people who are saved, he's saying. You know, the miracle of tongues that happened on the day of Pentecost, that was for people who were unsaved so they would get saved. Okay? Verse number 23. If therefore the whole church would come together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're all mad? I mean, imagine. Imagine you, you come to here and it's just a guy speaking Russian and nobody understands what I'm saying and somebody walks in here and they're like, do you understand what he's saying? They're like, no. They're like, why are you here? We don't know. They're, like, they're going to think you're crazy because it, it's a crazy thought. He's basically calling these people nuts is what he's doing. He's like, what are you guys doing? Are you guys nuts? That's what he's saying. Speak in languages that people can understand. All right? But if all prophesy, so prophesying is good, right? And there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets in his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. So if somebody comes in here and they hear the word of God being preached in their own language, they, they, they will get saved. They will be edified by that, right? How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course let one interpret. And now here's the whole, the whole conclusion of the matter is verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. He's like, if you can't speak the language that people in the church speak, just don't say anything. I mean, so the, here you had a church that somebody was getting up or people were getting up and they were preaching in languages that people didn't understand. This still isn't what's going on in, in uh, Pentecostal churches today. But I just want to, Paul's rebuking them for it. He's rebuking them. He's saying, <coughs> excuse me, he's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. You say, what, what, would, what would, he's saying prophesy good, unknown language is bad. That's what he says again and again and again. So you say, 
why would he even do this? Who would do this? Do you know that the Catholic Church held Mass in Latin until 1960? That Catholics would sit in... I just heard this from a brother this morning who grew up Catholic. And he said, I sat in Latin Masses until I was so many years old. The, 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 the priest would just get up and speak Latin. Nobody knew what he was talking about. This happens today. What Paul's talking about. And Paul spoke more languages than all of them. He said, I'd rather speak five words that you could understand than 10,000 that you couldn't. I mean, it's very simple. So, all right. Verse number 27 and 28, pretty much wrap it up. If there's no interpreter, if people can't understand you, just shut your mouth. It's basically what he says. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It was never, it was never just babbling that made any sense. Okay? That's what it never was. So you had these people that were messing up in this church, but turn to 2 Tim Timothy chapter 2, where the Bible says this. It says, but shun profane, in verse 16, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more what? Ungodliness. These vain babblings. And I don't even believe the like, stuff is even what he's talking about here. You had some people in this church here who were just speaking all these vain babblings that made no sense doctrinally. But, I mean, if we're going to talk about vain babblings, talk about just having these just outbursts of emotion that make no sense. Nobody knows what they talking about, talk about. They, they edify no one, and it just increases ungodliness, the Bible says. So this modern tongue speaking in Pentecostal churches is one of two things, okay? It's one of two things. And many people have admitted to me on the first one. All right? Can someone bring me an invitation to the church? One of the ushers, bring me an invitation up here. Modern tongue speaking. First of all, I've got one, brother. Thank you. Modern tongue speaking in Pentecostal churches. First of all, I've had many people tell me that what's going on is many people, especially the laymen of the church that get caught up in this and do it, they just fake it. They get worked up in the moment and they just fake it because there's a lot of pressure put on these people that says if you don't do this, you're not saved. You have to get slayed in the Spirit or baptized in the Spirit and speak in tongues or you're not saved. Wow. And if, if it doesn't happen to you every so often, it, it differs in every church. I mean, you want to talk about different answers out knocking doors, talk to Pentecostals, you'll get a different answer every time. But these people, there's a lot of pressure, okay? And the second one is people are possessed with the Spirit. And I believe that from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. And it's funny because we were just out yesterday soul winning, and we ran into a guy like this, Brother Johannes and I. And Brother Johannes went to give him an invitation, and he just grabbed the invitation. I don't even know if he said anything. And he just hands this guy the invitation, just like this. And hi, we're from Verity Baptist Church. That's as far as he got. The guy just looked at it and he said, Are you tired of shallow entertainment and are looking for sound biblical preaching? And he goes, and the guy comes out of his house and he's got an upside down cross tattooed on his forehead. For real, man. And he goes, I'm apostolic. And I have the Holy Ghost. And this isn't the Holy Ghost. And he's just like, Rah. And uh, Brother Johannes is like, that's great. Thank you, sir. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> and we walked, to the next, we walked to the next door. It was an apartment building. And he's still over there. I have the Holy Ghost. And you don't. I, and I looked at Johannes and I said, he's got some kind of spirit. Yeah. I mean, the guy, we didn't, we, he didn't get five words out of his mouth. He just looked at that and immediately got angry. I tell you what, I spent, I spent some years of my life unsaved. And I had Baptists come to my house when I was unsaved, and I was happy to see him. I never once thought Baptists were going to hell. Or I never once was angry when Baptists were knocking on my door. Actually, when I was unsaved and a Baptist came to my door, I'm just like, man, why don't we do that? Seems like we should be doing that. That was my thought. I wasn't like, ugh. <laughs> Look, I'm serious. These people are filled with the Spirit. Especially when they are stop wanting to stop the gospel from being preached. Okay? He had a spirit about him for sure. All right. So, tongue speaking. Tongues in the Bible is languages. 
Okay, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, when you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost isn't just going around wasting time. It had a very specific purpose. Okay, and look, it's not that miracles can't happen today. God can do whatever He wants. But all this stupid, vain babbling by a bunch of people that aren't even saved is not the Holy Spirit. It's some kind of spirit, or people just faking it out of pressure. I mean, it's like, it's like, the, it's like the unsaved version of an altar call. Right? These, these old IFB churches that are just pressuring people. If you don't come down to the altar, are you even saved? I mean, this is old. My old pastor used to do this. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm not going up to the altar. I don't know what this deal is with this altar call. It was weird to me always. Right? It was always the same guy that went up anyway. And the guy, always guy went up and he would just lay on his face and be like, oh, you know, up at the altar. And I'm just like, everybody's like, every, all eyes closed, every head bowed. And everyone's like... What? What is? I mean, I, and the, when I first joined the Baptist Church, like at first I thought this guy was super spiritual, and then I'm just like, and then I went into like, man, what is he doing every Saturday night? Where he has to do this, you know? And then after that, I'm just like, he's just vain, because that's what it is. He's just vain. He's just trying to be over spiritual and whatever. I'm not saying he wasn't saved, but it's just, it's just pressure. You don't, blah, 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 you're not saved. So they get all worked up and they're all shaking and they're like, woo, you know? And everybody's going, woo, and then you're like, oh, I want to be saved too. That's it. That's how it happens. But the leaders and the guys like we met yesterday and these people that started this movement, they were possessed by a spirit to make them do these things. Look, there's 30 million some plus demons running around on this earth. I mean, that's a real thing. All right, let's look at salvation in the Pentecostal church. Salvation. It's, it's, so, it's so dumb because it's so simple in the Bible. This isn't some complicated doctrine. I mean, this Pentecostal tongue speaking, I mean, the day of Pentecost, it was just a wonderful miracle. It was just a wonderful miracle. And you know what God can do? God can do whatever miracles He wants today. We're not saying we don't believe in miracles, but guess what? Miracles are going to be done, you know, but people that are going to be filled with the Holy Ghost are going to be saved people, and that miracle will actually have purpose to it. Good. Imagine, right? I mean, miracles are anything's possible. God can do whatever He wants. Salvation. Pentecostal beliefs on salvation from the horse's mouth. Repentance is an essential part of salvation. We must confess that we are sinners and ask God to forgive us. With the help of God's Spirit, we are to turn away from our sinful ways and turn towards His righteousness. When we repent, we open the door to God's forgiveness. We open the door, right? Water, baptism, is an essential part of the New Testament salvation. Not nearly a symbolic ritual. So you have to be baptized. You have to turn from your sins. Spiritual baptism. This is where you have to speak in tongues or you're not saved. For the in, or the infilling of the Holy Ghost is the seal of God in our lives and the guarantee of our inheritance of eternal life. So look, let me break it down for you. <clears throat> They're the Catholics of the evangelical world, basically, is what I like to call them. It's hardcore works. I mean, if you've ever actually known some of these people, they are just terrified. They are terrified of, of going to hell. They're terrified. If you fall away, you'll lose your salvation. That's the crux of the Pentecostal beliefs on salvation. You know, and whoever you ask, fall away, whoever you ask, it, it just depends. You'll get a different answer from every person on what fall away actually means. One lady I talked to a few months ago, fall away meant if she committed 12 sins a day. And I'm like, okay, why not? If you're going to make up stupid garbage, make up higher sins. You know, raise the bar for, you know, so you can get under it. 12 sins a day. Other, you know, a lady that my wife used to be in a homeschool group back in North Dakota. It wasn't a, it was a Christian homeschool group. It wasn't, you know, Baptist. But she was like, I wear pants at home and I'm going to go to hell. She was terrified of going to hell because she wore pants around the house. And her husband was like, you're falling away, you're backslidden. She's going to go to hell. I felt so bad for the lady. You know? Look, not speaking in, in tongues, this is where the pressure comes from. You've got to speak in tongues to go to heaven. You know? Blah, 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 blah. I want to get there. Right? That's where they're at. That's where they're at. It's just works, folks. Um, these people are deep into the mega church space. You know, Cornerstone Church, Pentecostal. The big Destiny Church up in North Sacramento, Pentecostal. All these apostolic churches, Pentecostal. The People's Church here, 
Pentecostal. I mean, it's not a small movement. It's playing on people's emotions, and it's, it's just works-based salvation. Okay? Now, let's conclude the whole series for you. Okay? Turn to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> That's the Pentecostal movement. I mean, it's, it's focused heavily on this speaking in tongues, baptism of the Holy Spirit. They take a phrase in the Bible, and they just, like, just run, run to the deep end with it big time. Right? It makes no sense. They're claiming, they're claiming Catholics and Mormons and Protestants, all people who weren't even saved, as, as evidence of this speaking in tongues. None of them are even saved. You know, you can't fall away, Pentecostal, because you're not saved. I'm sorry. All right? right? So, turn to Genesis chapter 3. So we just see, you know, I really started to feel unoriginal with this, with this whole series because we'd get to the end and we'd talk about salvation, and it always came to the same thing. It was just works, and it was another works-based religion, another works-based religion. You know, we could go on and on with it. I'm just trying to educate you on the kind of people that we're going to see, we're going to run into, the people that are local, you know, the ones that came from the United States especially. Um, you know, we could talk about the Reformation and the bastard children that came out of the Reformation for another 10 weeks, easily, right? Look at Genesis chapter 3. Here, here, let me wrap the Reformation up for you right here, all right? We'll wrap the Reformation up in 30 seconds. Genesis chapter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field with the Lord, which the Lord God had made. This is the Reformation, okay? The Catholic Church started in 313 A.D., and the Catholic Church got just way too stupid. I mean, they were selling tickets to heaven. They were making up different hells. They're selling all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and I mean, it's crazy. They got way out of hand. Infant baptism, you got to come to us to get saved. You know, it wasn't just works-based salvation. They were trying to get money from people. I mean, it was the ultimate, you know, scheme, scam, basically. And it, got, it just got out of hand, and people were just like, you know what, this is ridiculous. And the devil's like, you know what, the devil needs to be subtle. So the Reformation was Satan's plan B. Because it's much more subtle than the Catholic Church. The Catholics, at least, they're just like, yeah, it works. The, the Protestants that you will run into are, are like, oh, no, it, it's grace. But it's really, to, to get grace, you've got to do works. They're, they're wrapped up. They're wrapped around the axle. And, and you'll meet these people. We've met these people. It's, it's hard to get some of them saved because they're so wrapped up. So the Reformation was just Satan's plan B. He's a subtle, he's a subtle being. And he's very subtle with what he wants. So, look, don't be confused, all right? At the end of the day, there's only two religions in the entire world. It's works-based religions, and it's salvation through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. There's only two. There's not 500 all the different works-based religions, all the ones we talked about, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Pentecostals, all these different people, they're all the same. It's all works. The Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims, it's all the same. It's all works. Every single one of them, it's all works. There's only one religion that's true, and it's through believing on Jesus Christ, and that is the religion of the Gospel, of the Bible. That's it. All the rest is works. That's why I said last week, you won't find a cult that teaches true salvation through belief alone. You won't find it. Because they have to have works. Now you say, why is that? Yeah, it's control. It's control. But why just works, 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 works? Why? Why don't they think of something better? Why don't these cults these people that want people to join them. Uh, why is it always works? It's unoriginal, right? You're sitting there, it's unoriginal. Why, why don't they think of something better? Why not have a faith-based cult, right? Here's why. Turn to Isaiah 14. This is the whole thing. This is where we stick a fork in it, right here. <clears throat> Turn to Isaiah 14. I'm going to wait for you to get there. Why is it always works every single time? Why? Isaiah 14, look at verse number 12. And the Bible says this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I 
will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Works is the religion of Satan. Amen. Literally, it's the religion of Satan. It's his religion. That's why they all look the same. That's why when you cut through all the garbage, when you use the screen of the Bible, it's all just works because it's Lucifer's religion. Because I will get myself to heaven. I will be like the Most High. It's his religion. He invented it. He's not going to come up with something that says that you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No, you believe on you, and then you're damned to hell with him. Lucifer is a selfish being. He's an arrogant being that thought he could be above God. And works is his philosophy. So that's how you know. When you cut through everything, that's how you know if something is of God or not. When you cut through the philosophy, and at the end of the day, they, oh, they say it's grace through faith, um, but can, can I, is there something I can do to lose that salvation? Oh, yeah. There's something you can do. No, that's, the, that's Satan's religion. See? And it's subtle. But not really when you know what the Bible says. Amen. Right? So that's why we had this series. That's why we had this series. And, and it was on purpose that I showed you works, works. And we went through all the details and all the history, which is really interesting and funny at times. But there's a lot of people joining up to Satan's religion here. And it's up to us to make sure that people know the truth, right? So in order for people to know the truth, we need to know the truth. And we need to be educated on these things, all right? American heresy. There's a lot more to it, but I guarantee you if we would go through a dozen more, it's all works every time. The devil's religion. It's Satan's religion. It's Lucifer's religion. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for all the answers. We thank you for the great, the great screen that the Bible is, Lord, that you give us, that nothing can stand, nothing that's not true can stand up to the Bible. That no matter what these religions are, Lord, it doesn't matter what they're called, when it comes down to them being works, the screen of the Bible exposes them. The light of the Bible, the light of your word, Lord, exposes these religions. We, we love you. We thank you so much for the Bible and the privilege of being able to actually hold one in our hand, Lord, that a lot of people haven't had that privilege throughout history. And we thank you for this church and all the people in it. Lord, uh, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.